Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of The Less Stressed Life, where we teach exhausted and burnt out adults the truth about adrenal fatigue so that they can get their health back quickly. And today I'm joined with a special guest, Michelle Cavanaugh. She's a serial entrepreneur and speaker. She's the founder of The Sales Queen, an online program that helps business owners have more confidence in sales conversions and in overcoming objection. Michelle loves uh, for sale, sorry, Michelle's love for sales come from working at Vega Foods and traveling the world, convincing strangers to try new food products. And in 2015, Michelle decided to start her own company in the health industry. And now she helps others get their mindset right, elevate their confidence, and unleash their inner sales skills. Michelle, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited and looking forward to this chat we're going to have. Yeah, me, me too. And, you know, one of the reasons we're, we're really interested in that is because you didn't have any bones about sharing your own health experiences. And one of your most recent health experience has been um, breast explant surgery. And I, when I saw that and, and you, you sharing that with your, your following, uh, then I said, hey, I'd love to interview you and get your perspective on that and why and how and when and where. Because a lot of women that I work with that are exhausted and burnt out, they do say, hey, Joel, I've, I've had breast uh, implants, do you think this could be contributing to my exhaustion and fatigue? So before we get into all of that, Michelle, why don't you just tell us a little bit of your health journey in, in terms of um, just a little background on, on your view of health, your, your health history, just kind of give the listeners some ideas on where you're coming from. Yeah, so I have always been a health conscious person. I was very active in my teenage years, early 20s. And then I decided one time to compete in a fitness competition. And, you know, I was like, why not? You know, I'm gonna get in the best shape of my life. I'm gonna look back at these pictures when I'm 80 and be like, yeah, I had a six pack once, right? But that journey of, you know, going through extreme dieting and really just putting my body into a, a state of stress really was kind of like the first thing that I started to really recognize on this health journey of mine of things just going wrong. So shortly after I competed in this fitness competition, I got my implants. So I had my implants. It's uh, 2021. I got them in 2015. And so I started just to get like all of these symptoms and, you know, bloating. Um, I would, I had parasites for a year and a half in my gut. So just like gut issue after gut issue. Um, I started to feel really, really tired. I would have afternoon naps every single afternoon. And I was a napper, like I could nap for three hours. And it wasn't just like a 30 minute thing. And I would still feel exhausted. And, you know, all of, I just wasn't feeling great. I was eating a lot more sugar um, and reaching for that coffee, you know, later on in the day. And it honestly took me probably up until last year to kind of start to make all of these connections between, you know, maybe this could be my implants because I had seen gut yeah, infectious disease doctors from these parasites that came from Egypt, uh, apparently. I had seen naturopath doctors. I had seen almost every specialist that you could think of. I was just like, I am 32 years old. And I feel like I am like 75 years old and been smoking my whole life, you know, just like super unhealthy. And uh, so, yeah, it took me, I would say close to five years to really realize like, hey, so if I've seen every specialist, I've tried every elimination diet, uh, why am I still having all of these symptoms, right? And so that's what kind of led me to look more internally and like, okay, why am I so inflamed? Well, Sure, I do Botox injections, I do fillers, I do these kind of things, but what's inside of my body right now that has been there for a long time? Oh, that's maybe let's explore that. Yeah, absolutely. It's great that you have that sort of smelling salts under the nose, like, okay, it's something else that's not being seen. But I would rewind because part of the reason why I got into what I did and like Craig and yourself, and I was a trainer and spent many hours in the gym. And I think what happens is ultimately, 
the the fitness contestants that stand on stage are anything but healthy, so to speak, from a physiological point of view. They're dehydrated, um, they're inflamed, they they're depleted. You, you know, there there's a lot of things going on. So as far as how much did you consider the overtraining and the the rigmarole you put through your body as part of the health challenges besides just the actual act, the, the, the implants. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, and that's the confusing part about it all, right? Is there's so many different factors. I mean, when your body fat is so low and you've lost your period for like a year, it's like, okay, well, I need to start getting my body fat higher. And then what is that versus what is just like serious inflammation in the body due to something else? And then, you know, you switch your eating habits. Now I'm not doing cardio in the morning and weights at night. And now I'm just working out once a day. So there are so many uh, contributing factors that it could be. So it, it got really confusing until years down the road. Right. So, so you get more sophisticated. You start to understand it's not a reductionistic, just this for that. And that, unfortunately, we get tied into an allopathic approach like, hey, blood, high blood pressure, take high blood pressure pills, you know, high blood sugar, take, you know, high blood sugar pills. But sometimes that happens from the health standpoint to the holistic alternative approach. Hey, instead of taking Lipitor, let's take Hawthorne leaf and lower your cholesterol that way. Um, so it, it's not really a solution per se. So let me take, take me through then. I'd seen specialists. I had parasites. But then it came on my radar in terms of, okay, breast implants. And so what was the research, the due diligence, and how did you go through that process for a lot of the women listening that may not have it on their radar yet? Yeah. So I was seeing a chiropractor twice a week and that recently started two years ago because I was getting a lot of back pain and in the back pain, I was starting to get like in my neck kind of shoulders. And it, when you wear a bra and if you have a larger chest, of course you start to get these like little knots in your shoulders. And so started seeing a personal trainer and a chiropractor twice a week, but I still wasn't feeling like anything was improving. And so that was the first kind of aha moment besides all of the other things that I had mentioned, because that wasn't obvious to me, the connection between. Uh, so I had seen my chiropractor and I was telling him, Hey, listen, you know, I have breast implants and I just think that they're so heavy sometimes. And his wife had just gone through explants. And so he became like a super, like into it about like, he's like, Michelle, I'm going to treat you like my daughter right now. And he's like, I'm going to tell you everything that I know. And so he became my first point of um, information, I should say, because I, I was kind of like hocus pocus before, right? Like, come on, like this can't possibly be their safe. You know, plastic surgeons do these every single day all over the world. How can these be actually a thing? Um, and then he started telling me a little bit about his wife and his wife's journey and all of this stuff. And so I was like, okay, well now I started, it was starting to be in the back of my mind. Uh, and then I started to join groups. So there's a Facebook group and it's 145,000 women. It's called breast implant illness by Nicole. You can search it on Facebook and it's just women that are thinking about it or have gone through it. And there's just tons and tons of resources on that page. I think it's actually been around for over 10 years. Um, but it's just started to get a lot more momentum, I would say in the last like five years. And so that's been really great. And then every, so there's a list on that page and it tells you all the doctors that specialize in explant surgery, because again, there are some doctors, some surgeons that believe in it and then some that don't. And so the ones that believe in it, um, they're listed on that, that uh, page. And so I believe that there's, I would say close to 50 doctors all over the world. So all over the States. Um, and it's just a matter of kind of reaching out and figuring out which one feels right to you. I'm a really big believer in intuition and just having like, you know, that face-to-face -face Zoom or whatever, and just seeing if that person is right for you and then moving forward with that. So that's kind of how I started to, and then once you start into that group and you start looking at everyone's symptoms, you're like, oh, gut issues. Oh, anxiety. Oh, depression, back pain, which is obvious, you know, joint pain and inflammation, all this stuff. And you're just like, this is incredible. Like 
out of the 50 symptoms, I think I have probably had 25 of them easy. Yeah, listen, thanks for sharing. I mean, that's a that's very helpful for the listeners because ultimately you want to have resources there that that are confirmed with other people that are suffering with the same challenges and you will be met with uh, uh, objections or counterpoints of, oh, it's not a thing. And you found out it was a thing. So as far as would you say you attributed the, the symptoms that you had just to recap again from the training for the, for, the, for the fitness show and then just being tired and having to have a nap and feeling like you were 75, what GI issues, hormone imbalances, brain fog, like what was the whole gamut of all the things you were feeling? No, I would contribute it to the implants because I mean, they're like, I, I was always active before, right? Maybe not that extreme, but I was always in competitive sports. And so I understood what it was like to like eat proper nutrition and then train for it, eat and train, eat and train and stuff like that too. So I would hundred percent contribute it to the implants. And no, no, I wasn't saying, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase the question to recap all of the symptoms that you had after getting the implants in, what were um, all the ones that you attributed, attributed to the change and what you were feeling? Yeah. Yeah. So as far as all of the uh, symptoms that I started to get really in, like that I've noticed over the years would be brain fog, 100%, uh, joint pain. So like even to touch me, like when I would go get a massage or something, like I would feel bruised just from touching certain parts of my body, uh, gut issues, like I'd mentioned. And here's the crazy thing, even taking a deep breath. So because my, which can contribute to the anxiety, right? Because even when I take a deep breath and I do a lot of meditation, I could only do a four breath hold. And so now I'm two weeks out of my surgery. I can do six breaths. Like I can do a six breath hold. And so I, I, I can only imagine once all of the inflammation from the surgery goes down, maybe I'll be able to take even, even deeper breath. So even something like breathing properly, I've already noticed a huge improvement in my own health, which is incredible. Um, hair loss. I started balding right here um, on my hairline. I, the, they can't see, but I'm, I'm pointing at my, my hairline here on the left-hand side. Um, but that started to, I started to lose hair and hair loss is a big thing. And so I'm trying to think of what other symptoms I have, but I would say those are the main ones. And then back pain, of course. I mean, listen, you don't need any more symptoms than <laughs> ones that are debilitating like that. But one thing I'll say is, so I work with clients that are exhausted and burnt out. And I have a site called The Truth About Adrenal Fatigue, because ultimately, it's not thought of as the legitimate diagnosis. Um, and I tell people, Michelle, I say, look, just think of it as a demand and supply problem. Your stress response is so upregulated and so demanding of, of income or nutrients that you can't keep up with that. And you have an inequality between all the things you need to do in your body and all the ways that you can handle that. So what I do end up telling them is ultimately it's, it's a it's a mitochondrial problem, not an adrenal problem, but you're not producing energy at the cellular level that you need to. And ultimately your mitochondria is where oxygenation and respiration take place. So you're actually saying at the 30,000 view foot because of breast implants and physiological changes to your structure that you're not taking in as much oxygen per given breath and or you know minute times 365 times six, right? Because it's that long. And ultimately that's gonna cause you to produce more a less ATP or put less gas in your car and not be able to go for as much drives as you could. And in your body that resulted in brain fog and that resulted in um, you know, just feeling tired and maybe having some insulin resistance and feeling sleepy after a meal and just having a lot of achiness and soreness. So I think it's really important that you're, you're sharing this and bringing this to, to women's attention. Now, just to sort of switch it up a little bit, you help others with their mindset and their confidence to help with their helping the world and serving their mission and, and, and being in alignment with what they resonate with. But let me ask you, if you're helping people with your mind, their mindset, 
And I know for women, a, a big concern is, you know, aesthetically and, and having breast implants help with that. H may I ask just sort of a very personal question, how was it being able to deal with, okay, like th this was something I did to enhance you know, my self image or what I thought would enhance my self image, make me feel happier or healthier or just better in my own skin, only to not know that you had to remove them for health purposes. But what kind of impact would that have on um, the identity or the new identity or the change of identity and how that impacts your health? Yeah, that's a really great question. And you're exactly right. I mean, women get breast implants, whether they like it or not, because they want to look better, right? Maybe they're insecure and, or they've gone through a big shift in life where they feel like they need to do something different, right? Guys buy cars, girls buy implants. Um, and I think it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, you, you go through surgery and you have a positive outcome. You get a nose job, you like your nose better. Anything that's in that realm when you, you know, are wanting to improve yourself, it's a better outcome in most cases. And I bawled my eyes out the morning of my surgery to my surgeon, because I said to him, you know, this is, I'm now going through all of this trauma because surgery is trauma to an unknown result, to something that, you know, you, you look at pictures sometimes after of the, and you're like, whoa, like that looks completely, you know, not right. But it's, it's getting past that mindset shift of, this isn't about aesthetics anymore. This isn't about if this looks, you know, really nice or not right after. And so it was hard. It was really, really hard. And I went through the surgery. The, I had my first shower. It was about four days after. And so I took off all of the bandages and I had these drains in me. And so I couldn't even look at the drains because I've got a woozy stomach, <laughs> but I just looked at myself in the mirror and I, I, and I broke down again. I completely broke down. And, you know, Craig said, you're so beautiful, my partner. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this was way harder than I thought this would be. I mean, any woman can just stand up here and be like, yeah, I did that. And that was so brave and all this stuff people will say, but the actual realness of going through something like that, when you know because it's almost like it's not tangible. Like it is tangible. Like all of these things that I've mentioned about my health will improve. And I've already seen so many of them improve, but it's not like that thing that you can grab onto, right? It's not like it's more, more in your head. So um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. And I think that my biggest lesson from this whole thing is my idea of what attractiveness looks like and my idea of what pretty is. And just because you have larger boobs does not mean that you are more powerful or more significant than someone that has no boobs. And I think this, you know, identity of just being okay with it has actually made me a stronger person. And it was, it was, it was interesting because the surgeon before we went into the surgery said to me like, oh, it's not that he didn't want to do it, but he was like, they look so good though. And it was like, yeah. And I think just like that kind of thing in the back of my head was like, they do look good, but I am sick. And, and just to really stand behind that, that it's not about that. And I don't want to be a person that's known for someone that has a really great chest. I want to be known for somebody who has a really great heart and that is super kind. And so from a mindset point of view, it's, it's really, training yourself in a different way than aesthetically maybe what you've thought of yourself before and it's kind of going down to that like very spiritual deep level so i mean to anyone listening if you have implants or you know your mom has them and you're trying to convince someone to maybe make a different decision about them it's almost like you have to look at it like you're going on a spiritual journey because not only are you going to be getting your health back you're going to be a lot lighter a lot healthier and a lot happier, but there's something that shifts in your mindset as well that just makes you radiate different, makes you glow totally different than, and maybe it's the inflammation going down, I don't know, but I've every day gets a little bit easier. And like I said, they still don't look quite right and they will look better six months down the road because for some reason, 
when you put implants in your breast tissue decides to like move around. Uh, so about six months or so, all of the tissue will kind of come back into its natural place and things will be fine. So um, yeah, it's, it's been a lot more challenging truthfully than I thought it was going to be, but I'm so incredibly happy that I made this decision. Yeah, listen, a lot of wisdom in what you just shared. And I, I, it's not for me to comment because, you know, unless you give birth, you don't really know what it feels like to give birth, right? So, but what I do would say is when we work with our clients that have these massive trials and tribulations, Michelle, it's not fair. Like, it's almost like you couldn't write a movie script with the, the atrocities or just the crazy things that some of the clients I work with go through. Like, they had post-traumatic stress as a child. They were had a fire in their home. There was so many crazy things that happened. And ultimately their journey and their scars that physically or metaphorically they get as a result of their trials and tribulations is what becomes their defining personal um, sort of their, their strengths, their their, their major. So I, I always tell our clients, like, look, look at our trials and tribulations as gratitudes for things that we needed sort of a little knock on the head and say, hey, like, you can't go on this way. You need to change the action. And because you didn't wait too long for that problem to become a crisis that was past the no point of no return, you, you did something about it. And now you have a reminder about your new identified self and how that defines you as a stronger person. I mean, listen, I, again, like I said, I preface that with, I certainly did not go through that, but I think you already adopted that mindset um, knowingly or not when, when you went through this and realized it's a journey that you have some unanticipated feelings and emotions, but you're still holding strong to, I think the, the gratitude that you don't, that you're not articulating that makes you a stronger person. Would you agree on that as far as the comment on there? Yeah, most definitely. And I think it's all depending on too, your surroundings for a lot of it, right? I think that if you are in a circle of, you know, women who all have implants and it just seems normal, like for me, like all of my friends had implants when I got them. And so it wasn't like, I didn't really think to myself, oh, these can be harmful. It was kind of like, yeah, sure. That sounds good. Like might as well, you know? And uh, so, yeah. And I think it's now I totally like we're in Miami right now, which is like plastic central. Right. And I, it's like, I take out the dog and I just see implants everywhere. And and hey, it's your body, it's your choice. But the way that I look at implants is they're a ticking bomb. And maybe you haven't had symptoms yet, but if you just think of the logic of putting a plastic bag inside your body and your body is, is warm, it's, it's heating it up. And what happens when plastic is heated up? It starts to disintegrate, it starts to melt. And so it's just you know a matter of time before people start to get symptoms, unfortunately. And the cool thing is, is this group that I'm a part of, there's like 75 year old women getting their implants out, 80 year old women getting their implants out. They're like, you know, I just was thought about it. I was like, I want my health back. And I'm like, that is awesome. Like you went through a divorce when you were 60, you got your implants and now you're, you know, in your seventies, eighties, and you're just like, no, they're not for me anymore. So I think that when it comes to it, it takes time to make that decision for yourself. It took me almost a year. Um, but I wish I would have done it sooner. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, those are really great points. And to sort of continue on what you were talking about, not to make this a science class, but you're right. When you introduce something that is not natural to your body, it's not dormant. I mean, it's not like there's nothing going on. Um, your body has to deal with effectively letting sleeping dogs lie and there's physiological communication and there's inflammation and then it creates a slippery slope of if you already had some health challenges before then now you poured oil on the fire and you're having some major challenges i'm just curious with the particular doctor that you chose to to go with 
do they give you some kind of assessment, Michelle, as to had there been any leaking or had there been any immune uh, reactivities or scarring or any markers on blood work or anything that they tell you, hey, like we also see that there's some mold or are there other assessments that you could possibly do that they that this particular doctor did or that you researched? Yeah, so the doctor that I went to was in Costa Rica. And the reason why I went to San Jose was because I could get in sooner. There's a doctor in Miami that I really like as well. His name is Dr. Dev. I would highly recommend him if you're anywhere in the US. I would travel. He's amazing. Um, but his wait was like almost a year out. And I was like, no, I need to get these things out of me now. But some people do wait. Um, testing. So because it was in Costa Rica, they gave me a list of things to do beforehand. So one of them was a breast ultrasound. So with that, you can see if there is any leaking, but sometimes you can't. That's the thing. I mean, they, if it's a massive leak, sure. But with gel implants, gel sticks together. So unless it's a, you know, she's really pressing hard and getting a really good photo of what's going on inside, some of the times you can see, but some of the times you can't because I've known people who have had the ultrasounds before and then they've taken out the implants and there's been a hole. So you can't always trust those types of tests. Um, there's blood work. So there was a full pre-op panel that I did beforehand. And what else did I do? Uh, EKG, just kind of see, make sure everything's good with you. But yeah, those were the main tests that I did beforehand. And again, if this is something that you're interested in, you can go to that Facebook group and then there's a list of different tests that you can do for mold. You can do a ton of that blood work and stuff, but I don't know, like, I just feel like sometimes that was, that was a mandatory thing I had to do before surgery. That wasn't kind of my determining factor to get surgery. But if you're at the stage where you're like still kind of skeptical and still are like, oh, I'm just not sure if it is that, um, I would say to start really just tracking your own progress. And really just, maybe it's a journal you keep every single day and you're just like, how's my mood? How is my anxiety? How am I feeling today? What did I eat? How did it make me feel? And just really taking like an audit on your day because you can tell you the best. And I, and I mean, I do believe in tests, but there's some things that you can just get carried away with. And then you're seeing specialists every single day doing all of these different tests to just find out that maybe nothing's wrong because that's the things that some of these tests will tell you. It's like, no, everything's fine. And then everyone looks at you like you've got five eyeballs, right? So I think just doing the tests that you think are appropriate for you, maybe a blood panel would be helpful for you. And really just starting to meditate, starting to really just look internal and just to really listen to your body. And I know that can be kind of a weird thing for some people, maybe if they've never done that before, but really just, just telling, just keeping track of how you feel and then comparing it against, you know, month one to month four, are things getting worse, you know, and kind of based having a baseline off of that. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. I think that there's a Goldilocks zone with anything like acquiring information, not having enough, acquiring too much information. And as someone we know says, speed of implementation is key, right? So if you're doing too many didactic or or just research on things you don't actually get the process or the procedure done that that's defeating the purpose and i think going back to what you said with the 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 frequency or the the woo woo a little bit about knowing that this doctor was for you you had that good sense you also probably correct me if i'm wrong had the good sense that intuitively you knew like the breast implants need to come out. Like I could research to the cows come home, but it's, and I could validate and make sure that this number would have been lower if it was higher or higher if it was, but you know, it needs to come out. So I think that's a great point. However, I work with a lot of clients where I'm not to say you weren't suffering with a challenge, a health challenge, but we sometimes see the perfect storm the, the really been to 15 different doctors, spent $50,000, have so many different testing. And, and ultimately, there are other physiological things that are going on in your body uh, that created a, a breast implant sickness that would be 10 times worse with all those other things that were going on too. So let me ask you this, as far as I'm curious to know, 
do they have any recommendations, Michelle, the doctor or the research or the Facebook page, which I, we do put this on my website. So I'll put the links to the Facebook page as well as how to get in contact with you if people have questions, if that's okay. So, but as far as, do they have any recommendations as to um, potential recovery strategies like nutrients, supplements, getting quicker, better from when you don't, when you actually have the procedure? I'm just curious to know about that. Yeah, so they recommend, I don't know if you've heard of the medical medium. Yeah, he does right. a lot of the celery juice stuff like yeah. that. Um, so they recommend a protocol. Every doctor is a bit different, but just going based on this group is kind of where I'm testing out some different stuff. Um, so I've now done a paleo diet. That's kind of the protocol that I'm following right now. Um, just really sticking to the basics, making sure that I'm, you know, don't have any sugar besides like fruit sugar um, and just trying to eat a high protein diet with some sweet potatoes here and there. Um, so just really keeping it simple on my gut because I still feel a lot of inflammation in my stomach, especially could be the painkillers, could be the antibiotics that you're put on for a week after. And it's just kind of coming out of my system now. So, you know, really making sure my fiber intake is higher that kind of thing. So um, as far as diet and protocol goes, I think just really sticking to a clean diet, um, making sure that you're super hydrated as much as you can, and just not trying not to uh, eat bad food, eat fast food, that kind of stuff, because, you know, you're now trying to detox your body, heavy metals are a thing with implants. And so um, I'm still kind of exploring what that's going to look like, but for the first month, I'm really just using food as my medicine until maybe next month, I'll look at some type of uh, heavy metal detoxes, stuff like that, but really just trying to get all of those um, antibiotics and everything out of my system at the moment. Yeah, and that's great. I mean, no matter who does the procedure and what they recommend, there's always going to be core competencies that everyone should implement. And that's obviously good mindset, good surrounding, good nutrition, keeping it simple, always really great things. The other thing I would add as well is sort of the analogy of when people get their mercury amalgams pulled. I, I use the, the analogy of like a like a magnet where you have the two opposite ends, they repel each other. So when you have mercury in your teeth and you get them taken out, it kind of takes that opposing magnet out of the body. So wherever, wherever the outgassing of mercury got deposited in other tissue over the years that you've done it, kind of like say, oh, we can come out and play a little bit. There's no nothing kind of keeping us you know, in suspension and not coming out. And I think it's true with breast illness uh, and, and explant surgery is, is that it outgas, it heats up, it, it creates vapors, it creates uh, residues that get deposited. And now that that's out, your body's naturally going to be in a position to dump and remove like you've alluded to. However, the challenge is, is if we don't have, if we've been really sick for really long, and we don't have the physiological reserves to deal with all of the dumping that would happen. And that's where, again, being able to customize some of your, your pathways and making sure that you have good B vitamin status or you're getting enough oxygen at the cellular level so that you're producing ATP or you're calming down your inflammatory pathways a little bit better or you're supporting some of those detox pathways. If you have questions, we can do that after, after the show. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's sometimes what would happen. I don't know if they have that on the website that I will on the Facebook page, but have you heard of any challenges or maybe some, I won't say side effects, but some kind of recoil for some women that um, once they donate or get their uh, breast uh, explant surgery done, they have some challenges now with the sort of the sand, the ocean floor that was kicked up and having all the sort of the murky water start to settle down. Do you hear of anything like that at all? Yes. And that's a really good point that you're bringing up because, you know, I can say, yep, yep, they're out and everything's just, you know, rainbows and sunshine right now and everything's going well for me. But I know there's been some women that have broken out in complete rashes 
you know, rashes or, or things that are coming up um, on their face, like maybe they're getting super dark circles under their eyes and they're like, hey, but wait a minute, you know, now that these are out, I should be, you know, healing and getting better. But I think one of the most important things that everyone needs to consider is that healing looks different for everyone. And depending on how long you've had them for, depending on, you know, just your body, the health of your body before you go into the surgery, this can take up to two years to be fully detoxed, to be fully um, on that lighter way to a healthier life. So it's important to know that, you know, maybe someone might be feel better a week out and some person might be feel better a year out and then two years. So to know that your body is doing the best that it can to get all of this out and to be healthy, the body is an amazing, amazing thing. And so that's why it's so important to really facilitate not only what you eat, you know, making sure you're sticking to whole foods and healthy foods, but your mindset too, making sure that you are doing your meditations and practicing gratitude um, because it all plays such a huge role in it, making sure you're going for those walks midday if you've been sitting, you know, at your desk and just getting that movement in you. When you recover, you're not supposed to exercise for four weeks, but I'm going for little walks here and there just because I have to. I have to for my mindset of things and just not making sure your, your heart rate's staying down as much as possible. But yeah, healing looks very different for everyone. And to say, you know, this is what happens sometimes, it's, it looks completely different. But rashes are a big one that I've seen um, with a lot of women. Yeah, I mean, you, awesome information. Again, I, I interviewed Frank Benedito. I'm sure you know that name from Craig. And we talked about four pillars that no matter what your niche is or what health strategies you do, if you did four pillars and the first one's movement, right? So that's really key. I mean, if you're sedentary all day, especially with COVID and being locked up I mean, just moving and you're not gonna go lift weights, but you're moving and getting your heart rate elevated, that's key. Obviously the nutrition that you do is, is super key. Um, doing healthy habits that help you go to sleep earlier and wake up later and have a better sleep and then mindset stuff uh, those are four major pillars that no matter what happens, you need to do. But I would also say for some of the women that are really struggling, that explant surgery on top of everything made everything sort of stirred up the pod and kicked the ocean floor. That's where typically someone like myself or who's trained in looking at the perfect storm, we recommend doing a, a, a nutrigenomic test, which basically looks and says, hey, okay, Michelle, you have problems with like histamine clearance and that could create a lot of your, your rashes because as you get those explants out, you're dumping some of those extra toxins and your body's not dealing with it effectively. The liver's overloaded. It's creating more inflammation and your body just doesn't have the manpower to deal with that. So here's what we could be doing. Or, you know, your microbiome is depleted and there's not enough good short chain fatty acids. So we can, so just, it's a little more elaborate and, and I'm happy to hear that's not something you're dealing with because you had what we call more metabolic flexibility. You had the ability to walk on that tightrope and be pushed one way or the other, but not fall off. And that's a testament to those four pillars, your health history already. And I would agree 100% on the mindset, like in terms of like the gratitude and, and now your, your new, I guess, you, you know, metaphoric scar is a thing of beauty now, not a thing to be ashamed of. So awesome information. So as far as what you do, how do you feel this may change how you consult with people in their health journeys? Yeah, so as far as how I believe, you know, I don't, I guess, I guess it's like, my messaging, I guess, for younger women, especially because, you know, I work a lot with confidence and mindset and sales and helping women um, present themselves online. And I think it's just made me aware of the impact that some things that we talk about just that we think is common knowledge or just normal or our ideas of what looks good. Um, might have shifted a little bit. I remember I made this video on my Instagram and it was basically about like 
revealing all of the different procedures that I've had done. And, you know, I kind of had this message of just like, be you, do what makes you feel good and that kind of thing. And I think my message is still that it's still, you know, do what makes you feel good. And, but I think if it compromises your health, that's where my stand is different. Whereas before I didn't, I wasn't really aware of that health impact. So uh, definitely, you know, I think if I, it was funny, I had a conversation with someone recently and she told me she was thinking about getting implants. I've had many women reach out to me and say, you know, I'm considering this and I just had two kids and I've been with my husband for the last 15 years and I'm thinking about getting implants. And the first thing I think about is why now? Um, and I kind of have a different open conversation with them, I guess. And so I think for me and my business and just kind of where I stand, I've wanted to share this journey on my platform uh, just to be a resource and just to be that person who is not going to tell anyone what to do, but just to give them the information so that they're able to make a decision for themselves and what's best for themselves. Because I never like to be told what to do. I mean, most people don't like to be told what to do, right? Um, but it's important to have that information there. And just, I, you know, I don't work in the health space, but what I do is more in the business space. But I think nowadays it's so important to be transparent with you know your story your why and showing more of your personal brand even if it's not directly correlated with the thing that you sell and so that's why for me I wanted to share as much as my journey as I could with my audience and I actually created a second account called no fake boob um, where I kind of showed more in detail about my whole procedure uh, just to be a resource for people, because this is something that I wish that I had, you know, six years ago when I was going through this whole process, just to have that information out there to know, oh, okay, six years from now, you know, maybe these things are going to get taken out. So, yeah. No, that's great. Listen, I, w there's a lot of lessons to be learned in that. And I, I think that one of the speakers we heard talk, they say there, or oh, I think we froze here. Um, We'll see when you come back here and we'll edit this out because it looks like you froze for one second. Um, Am I back? Hopefully we'll come back here, Michelle, in one sec. Hey, sorry. Did we freeze? <laughs> yeah, I got I got booted out. So oh. sorry. So what I was gonna say, I'll edit that part. Is we learn like you know our our mess is our message, right? And and figuring out. But the thing that also happens in that just being authentic and and being a resource is now you kind of crystallize who it is that you help. For me, my message has been, hey, I'm I'm a, I'm a little neurotic, I have anxiety, I'm fatigued and exhausted, I don't focus well, and, and I help people that are exhausted and burnt out. But, but I also attract more of the sort of anxious, not focusing well type of person that is looking for that as well. So do you feel like it's gonna impact maybe a, a different set of coaching clients given that you're telling your, your personal story? Possibly. I mean, for me, it's, um, there was no real strategy, I would say behind like, okay, these are the types of women that I want to, you know, now work with and help them grow their businesses online. Um, definitely, I think it could be helpful. I mean, even some of the people that have been following me, like, they're like, oh, my aunt has this or my, so now they're, they're helpful in the education. So even if it's not my direct community it's now them helping other people too and it just kind of grows from there as well something too that i wanted to mention um and why it's so important to find a doctor that specializes in this is because a lot of doctors just will remove the implant and that's like a 20 minute procedure right you just go through the incision you remove the implant and you that you're done but when you do a proper explant surgery is where you actually remove 
uh, the full end block is what it's called. And so essentially what it is, is you have to have your implant, which is like a, you know, your, the, the bag, and then you've got a layer of tissue that develops around it because when it goes into your body, your body goes into a defense mode. And then, so what happens is this tissue, that's what really needs to be removed. And it takes a microsurgeon to be able to go through and to cut out that uh, layer over top. And so my surgery took over two hours to do versus just a 20 minute thing. So if you do get it removed, make, make sure that you ask the surgeon and you've done your research on if they do a full M block removal because it takes more skill and more time. And a lot of doctors will try to avoid it and you'll still have the symptoms because all of the toxins will be stored in this uh, layer over top. So I just wanted to, to add that onto it as well because it's super important. Yeah, very, very important. It's, you know, not all programs are created equal, right? And and sometimes, I don't want to say cheap is, you know, but, you know, it, it can be doing, my wife always says to our kids, you know, the lazy man works twice as hard, right? And ultimately, if you're not getting rid of that encapsulation tissue, but you saved a couple dollars, or you didn't do your due diligence, you're not con completely extinguishing the ember. And now you haven't really completely, that's an awesome point. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, so when with our guests, Michelle, we always like to end with, Hey, given what you know now, especially with what you've been through from a health journey and the, I guess you would call it the risk reward, right? The cost benefit outcome. What would you maybe have done differently with your health um, what I always tell people like the, the sage, like Michelle would have whispered in the bright eyed and bushy tailed Michelle so many years ago that may have saved you health challenges or um, just a different outlook on life. But what would you have shared back then to your younger self? Um, I would have, first of all, not done it. Um, and I would have started to go more on a spiritual journey earlier on in life. And I think that oftentimes when you reach for something, whether that's food, alcohol, drugs, whatever your, your vice is to cope, um, we often, it's often a band-aid solution. And this was essentially a state of life that I was in that was a band-aid solution. It was a quick fix to like, I'm going to feel better about myself. I'm going to, you know, all of these things. And so I think for me, I wouldn't have done it. And I would have looked more internally and maybe that switching up the people that I was surrounding myself with, um, looking at probably, you know, maybe in my lifestyle choices, little not, not drinking so much, that kind of stuff. Um, and just really started to try to be the best version of myself earlier on um, than trying to reach for all of these quick fixes. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we wouldn't have figured that out if we didn't go through that journey, right? So I've had people say like, well, I don't think I could ever change that. But that's awesome information. Michelle, thank you so much for all the wisdom you dropped here. As far as how do the listeners find out more about what you do with with helping with sales and with understanding their personal skill sets and confidence and mastery. How do we get in contact and find out more about what you do? Yeah. So the best place is Instagram and it's just my full name plus an extra H. So it's at Michelle Cavanaugh. And if you've got any questions and you want to talk about sales, or if you want to talk about breast implants or whatever, anything in between, uh, please send me a message. That's awesome. And what I'll do again, like I said, is I'll include it in my show notes on my website and have a link there so they can go directly to you. But I want to be respectful for your time, Michelle. Thank you so much for everything you shared with us. And most importantly, I wish you continued success on your health and life journey and look forward to hearing some successes along the way. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle.